Hastings Entertainment, in association with Valiant Entertainment, presents Comics College, your guide to making comics like the pros. Attend the Comics Workshop to learn the tricks, then submit your entry for a chance to become Valiant's free Comic Book Day 2016 cover artist. Uh, I'm Tyler Wentland. I won the Valiant Entertainment uh, Hastings Bookstore's Crafts of Comic Contest, and I just wanted to make this video to say that if you are um, participating in one of their contests, you really are in for a treat. Um, both companies are great. The staff are just as passionate about comics and um, the contest as you are. So, you know, feel free to ask questions. They're great with communication um, and have fun. Have fun on the page. Um, that's the most important part. So, good luck. Enjoy. Join us and maybe you could be Valiant's free Comic Book Day 2016 cover artist. You've waited long enough. Comics College begins right now. Hello! Welcome to the very first episode of Comics College, coming to you live from the headquarters of Valiant Entertainment in New York. My name is Hunter Gorenson. I'm the Director of Marketing, uh, Communications, and Digital Media at Valiant. Joining me is Valiant Special Projects Manager, Mr. Josh Johns. How's it going? And we are here today to walk you through the fundamentals of how to make comics like a pro. Uh, someone who's been doing it for a very long time. Too yeah. long. For many of the finest publishers in comics, Mr. Fred Van Lente. Hello. Uh, before we get started, uh, we should tell you what the prize that we're going to be offering uh, for Comics College is, which is uh, art submissions. Get them into gohastings.com slash comics college, and you can enter for your chance to see your artwork featured on the cover of Valiant's Hastings exclusive free comic book day edition coming in May. Big prize, uh, big reward. You can find out more information awesome. on that again at gohastings.com slash comics college. So uh, there's a lot of steps that go into making comics. We're gonna cover a lot of them over the next four weeks on the various episodes of the show. But before anyone can draw anything, before anything can get colored, before anything can get lettered or be bought in a shop like Hastings, it all starts with the writer. So Fred, You've worked for many of the biggest publishers in comics, Valiant, Marvel, Image, the list goes on. Where did your, before all that, where did your experience with comics begin? Was this something you always set out to do professionally? No, uh, although I learned to read thanks to comics, like uh, my father had this book called The Great Comic Book Heroes that was the, the cartoonist Jules Pfeiffer wrote an essay about growing up reading comics and, and becoming a, a cartoonist for the first time during the golden age of comics. And it was a great book because it not only had High Pfeiffer's essay, it had um, all the like the, the the origins of the Golden Age superheroes, so Superman, Batman, Captain America, Submariner. And I would just make my mother read them to me. Make her and beg her to do it. And finally she was like, Enough already, I'm sick of this. <laughs> and so she refused to read that book to me. So I just sat down and and sort of, you know, just kind of stared at it and <laughs> rubbed it on my face until the meaning of the words <laughs> connected the pictures kind of uh, kind of rubbed off on me, and so I, I literally learned to read thanks to comics, and I could read before, uh, I think I started kindergarten, was the family story I was told, so uh, my mother changed her tune, tune was very pro-comics after that. Very cool. So what was your first gig, paid or otherwise, as a professional comics writer? I went to Syracuse to um, be a screenwriter. But I ended up hanging out with the guys from the comics club, a lot of whom were studying to be comics artists themselves. And one of them was Steve Ellis, uh, who started getting uh, work you know, soon after he graduated. In fact, for Valiant, uh, one of his first gigs was oh, Ninjack. Really? He, oh, he was the guy who followed Joe Quesada on Ninjack, actually. Well, old school Valiant reference there. Uh, and so with him, we started doing comics, and I did a, we did a science fiction strip called Tranquility, got optioned by a studio and they asked me to do Cowboys and Aliens and so that was a book that was later turned into a movie and that was when I first paid that was that Cowboys and Aliens was really my first sort of big paid gig I'd done bits and pieces for things uh, every once in a while uh, through Steve I got uh, I wrote a story at a company called Malibu that sure. came out in the mm -hmm. mid 90s along with the first run of Valiant Comics so uh, but I think the most significant one where People sort of really took a chance. I mean, because I, I did the job for Malibu, but then Malibu kind of went out of business, or they were a subsidiary of Marvel technically, and yep. then Marvel shut them down mm -hmm. after that. But I, the, really, the first one that I did, where I really felt like, oh, you know, I, I can do something that's kind of mainstream and, and isn't just this kind of weird, quirky thing that I like, was probably Cowboys and Aliens. Cool. So before you can start working on a series, if it is for a major publisher like Marvel or Valiant, 
you have to start with one document, usually, right. the pitch. So what goes into a pitch document and what kind of formatting, et cetera, would an aspiring writer seek to have in their own pitch document? Well, uh, the pitch basically is two, maybe three parts. The, the most important part of it is the first couple sentences. And it sounds reductive, but whenever you know you are recommending a TV show to a friend or you're, you're talking about a movie you just saw, you're pitching it, really. They, the first question you always get is, what's it about? And so you know, usually that sentence that you then come up with to describe it, unless you're really long-winded and boring and start from the beginning of the movie then. And you never do that with your friends. They would tell you to shut up and they, you know, their eyes would glaze over. Uh, you, you really want to condense it down to you know, a one sentence. And usually that sentence is be what you find interesting about it. You know? In fact, you know, most things that become popular, you, know, you could just know from, you know from the pitch. If I said, you know, chemistry teacher becomes meth kingpin, you immediately know you know, mm -hmm. that's Breaking Bad, sure. and I just described Breaking Bad, mm -hmm. you know. A uh, young starfighter uh, has to overcome great evil in the galaxy. Obviously Star Wars, you know, mm -hmm. by the, any of them. <laughs> any nine of them, or seven of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, be the most important thing, and, and there's a bunch of different um, uh, terms for that, like, for movies, for a long time, they were called log lines because, as I understand it, you would actually log in the projects and in in, in when they came in, and, mm -hmm. and there would be a one sentence description of them. Uh, a lot of times, I think this gets called the elevator pitch because uh, there's actually two different versions of the elevator pitch. The first time I heard it described as the elevator pitch was that it's called the elevator pitch because it would make you keep from getting on an elevator. If you had to get in an elevator and somebody said, High school teacher becomes a drug kingpin. Oh, really? You're like, what? And then like you ding, and then the elevator would go. Or the other, then someone, <laughs> the area tells them, and then they're like, no, no, no. It's because it's the amount of time it takes you to take an elevator ride mm -hmm. is why it's the elevator bridge. So I think the first version I heard is better. But uh, regardless, uh, the hook, it's also called the hook. Um, really, it's just sort of the TV guide description, or the that's, that's an ancient reference for you kids out there. <laughs> for the you know the when you do the guide and, and time war and the, the cable the history of the TV yeah, guide. Exactly. So there used to be a magazine. <laughs> you know, probably still is a so if you're working on uh, like a big series like you've done, like Archer Armstrong or Amazing Spider-Man, you'd obviously prepare a pitch for what you think your story is. Does right. that format usually hold? Does that carry over when you're doing a creator-owned project like yes. Action Philosophers? Yeah, yeah. cool. So yeah, because you you still need to something unless you're self-publishing it, which is what actually we do with Action Philosophers. Right. However, we got a grant in order to do Action Philosophers, okay. so we still had to do that kind of document. So basically, you do a, a couple sentence paragraph tops, loose, uh, you know, ten ten thousand feet overview of the project and then you do a page-ish page and a half single single space single uh yeah single spaced um description Got of it. the basic gist of where the, the thing is going i mean i generally find the average pitch document and that to me is the pitch that paragraph because you can't really just do the the one paragraph because if they like it and i hope well they, if they don't like it the rest of it nobody cares they're sure. just not going to read it if they do like it then they're going to say well tell me more and so there's the first part is the elevator pitch the second part is the tell me Cool. And so let's say everything goes swimmingly. You knock it out of the park like you always do. That's right. Um, Adding a thousand. Sit down, writing page one. What's the first step that goes in converting the story that you've outlined near your pitch into an actual script that you're going to provide to an artist? Well, the the what makes comics unique and having done prose and having done screenwriting, you know, what makes a novel can be anywhere from 100 to 600 pages. A movie can be anywhere from you know 90 to 100 to 180 minutes. Uh, a comic book, typically, if it's an American-style serialized comic, it's going to be 20 or 22 pages. One of the two. Um, and so, from your publisher, you need to find out, okay, how many issues are approved for, how many pages are in your typical comic, you know, for Valiant it's 22, for Marvel it's 20. Uh, Image usually has 20, although that's set by the creators. Um, and then you, then you don't know have many pages you have. You have real estate. You know, uh, comics is a real estate-constrained medium. You know, you, can, you don't, if you turn in an 18, <laughs> number one, you get paid by the page. So if you turn in an 18-page uh, script, artist is you know, now out four pages worth of, of, uh, of money, as are you. If you turn in a 26-page script, uh, that you're going to blow the budget on the issue, and the publisher's going to be like, what are you doing? You know, we can't afford to do 26 pages. So really, you, you, because it's so real estate uh, constrained, I, baked, I have a spiral notebook, and I just baked, basically go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 22, and then I just write down briefly what is in it. Each um, what happens in a couple words 
on each page. And usually it's, it's basically borderline code that only I can understand, right. you know, like, you know, ice cream. Like, what does that mean? Is this scene in the ice cream parlor? Is <laughs> the main character to get turned into ice cream? Who knows? Uh, but it's okay. It's just for my use. Sometimes the publisher is going to want you to actually do a page by page breakdown as a document, which runs two, three pages. Um, and then you go from there to once that's approved or once you have it down in your own head, because the, the challenge, um, with writing fiction, I find, and probably nonfiction to a certain degree, but with fiction, it's always best to know where, where, where you're going to end up. Uh, it's always good to know your ending before you start. You know, it's kind of like, you know, it's a journey is a lot of fun, but if you don't have an actual destination, you can meander and you can get lost and you get very frustrated. And it's the same thing with writing. Cool. Awesome. And they... We have a lot of, you know, uh, hopeful writers in our audience. I'd like to kind of break it down and get into one of my new of like your process. Sure. Can you talk to us about how you break down the individual comic page? Like how that actually looks, what you list first and right. format? Yeah, I mean, um, at the most basic level, a, a screenplay or a comic script is no different than a screenplay or stage play. You're giving a scene description and dialogue. And for the artist, who is your director and your all your actors and and typically your sound guy, and he's definitely your for, fight choreographer and your and your cinematographer. You just need to give him as much information as you possibly it, all the information he needs and no more to do it to execute a page. So uh, my ideal um, virtuous situation is to have uh, a page of a physical paper page of script for each um, comics page. And I prefer to have one sentence per panel description. Um, now, that's kind of an idealistic. And, and the, the one page per page rule, I tend to do very well. You know, if you're describing what characters look like, what setting looks like, you know, you're going to get more than one sentence. But if you have established characters and setting, to me, there's no reason to have, you know, um, more than one sentence per, per, script, uh, per panel description. And then you need to offset from that... Um, through some some guys use um, a screenplay format where the dialogue is, is sort of centered. Right. Uh, I have uh, I do it through the indents in Word. Um, you you need to set off the dialogue from the scene description. So an artist and and when when I refer to artist, I also mean the letter. I also mean the the, mm -hmm. the anchor, and I also basically mean the editors. Every anybody who needs to look at the script to know what the story is needs to be able to instantly differentiate between what is dialogue and what is um, uh, scene panel description. Yeah. Scene description. Cool. As far as the format goes, do you ever put caps on yourself of how many panels? Like, Do you have, do you have guidelines you like to use for those? Yeah. Um, you know, five or six is, is, a, is a nice stack page. Uh, anything less than that, you, you tend to need to have bigger action. I mean, the, the simple rule for page layout is the bigger the moment, the bigger the panel. That's being, you know, as people read things on their phones and their iPads, that's, that's maybe being reduced a little bit more. I mean, uh, the big innovation, of course, is the double page spread, which is two pages that are one, that's one panel, the splash page, or one page is one panel. Um, but, you know, I've seen guys, uh, Kano, who we did the delinquents mm -hmm. with, who do a lot of work with his great artist here at Valiant, he will take a script and sometimes break it into 13 panels. Like, he, mm -hmm. he very much likes going into the menu. And let's talk about that because you've been, you know, fortunate in your career to work with so many artists and so many, some of the best artists in the industry. How has your, how does your writing approach change uh, based on the artist that's assigned to the project, if it changes at all? I mean, you need to know, you need to know people's strengths. You know, some people like drawing monsters. Mm -hmm. Some some guys in the industry and women are known for drawing really beautiful women, so you sort of tend towards that. Some guys uh, are really good with action. Some people are very photorealistic, mm -hmm. and so. Uh, or have more of a noir feel. They use a lot of shadows. So, I mean, usually publishers and editors have that in mind when they assign art artists mm -hmm. projects in the first place. That's why it's frequently called casting. Same thing as with actors in movies. And so, you know, you you know, hopefully you're, you're you're starting out with an artist um, that you already know, you know, fits the project. But on the other hand, you know, as just as artists get, in, or excuse me, just as actors get annoyed with being typecast as you know, the funny one or the sidekick or whatever, you know, most comic artists who are good storytellers can tell any kind of story. You know, the, the casting thing largely is... Um, and some people end up, unfortunately, get, just as actors are, get pigeonholed into maybe roles. That, 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 that's the problem, unfortunately, with being really good at something. <laughs> it's people, when they're sitting down with a list of people to hire, they go to that person that they know will do this thing that they're looking for. And they don't consider them 
to do something to be outside their comfort zone and what the, the, the industry sees as your comfort zone. And your largest role as a writer in writing the story is the creation of script, the formation of the ideas, getting that, getting it you know, to the art stage. Once it goes to the art stage, how much uh, impact do you have on the comic as it goes through pencils, inks, coloring, yeah. lettering, production, final product covers? Where do you have your input at that stage? Well, it, it varies quite a bit. I mean, in general, I think that people like to have the writer um, on the email thread that has all the, the various stages of artwork um, submitted for approval, just because I think, um, <laughs> number one, if the, artist, if the writer really freaks out about something at the very <laughs> end of the process, that's just a giant pain. You have to go and, and revise that. Uh, and also, you know, just from a practical standpoint, an editor may be working on a dozen titles at once. The writer probably only has three or four. So she may have the right idea. You know, she knows the story better than the editors mm -hmm. for the most part. I think it's editors. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, but, uh, but I mean, it just, it's just a practical, practical thing. On the other hand, I've also been in situations where, you know, um, I haven't seen anything until it's done. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's an oversight and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> but by that point it's kind of too late and then you end up writing around them and you sort of get you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that your next question is, <laughs> is where do you end up after the art is done I was actually going to ask that but also for you to touch on uh, a lot of people know the job editor so it's right. a popular job here in comics a lot, of, a lot of people don't really know what an editor does on a project to project basis can you talk about some of your experiences working with editors and, and how they uh, help along the project and what they kind of do well I mean and you know you You've been an editor yourself, mm -hmm. so so feel free to correct me no, <laughs> if I if I horribly denigrate your your profession. But uh, I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of being an editor is a traffic cop. A lot of it is making sure everything is coming in when it needs to come in, and it's making sure that people are on time, mm -hmm. and it's making sure the whole team is coordinated. And I think another part of it, particularly in a company with a universe like Valiant or DC's, mm -hmm. is making sure the universe has that kind of internal consistency and make sure that. That the the, the 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 property is being reflected in, in the way that that puts its best foot forward and, and sort of hits the goals. And now I'm totally getting the corporate speak here, but it's a yeah. very corporate situation. Uh, you know, it's hitting the messaging of the, the, the higher ups. Yeah, absolutely. And once you're working on a project, you've, you've worked on ongoing series. You work on limited series. You've done a number of events. Uh, yep. How does your writing, graphic novels? Standalone graphic novels. How does your process change? Basically, these are all still comics, but right. in different formats. How does it change based on these formats? It doesn't. I mean, it's like real estate. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter at all. I mean, I think that um, you know the the toughest thing I think is to end an ongoing. Or you know, for me, what I've found difficult is um, I I sort of come from a novel and a film background. I like things generally speaking that end mm -hmm. that have third act conclusions. And so when you're dealing with other people's properties, a lot of times there really can be no closure to the series. Number one, it's not really a right because you can create those characters in the first place. And secondly, because the, the, the publisher is going to want to revise those characters in that series mm -hmm. at some point and, and with other creators, presumably. So, um, uh, so sometimes that's been a bit difficult for me to sort of end you know, my tenure on a book and mm -hmm. then... So, but leave it still open, so it's satisfying for the readers, but still sets it up for someone else to come along and get the driver's seat and take off. And often in comics, because you're dealing with a lot of times universes, different writers, a lot of collaborative process with other writers. You did it with Legend of the Geomancer. You had crossovers in Archer and Armstrong, a number of, of uh, uh, worked with Greg Pak a lot at Marvel, of course. Sure. How does that? How does collaborating with an, a writer or with characters that maybe aren't the sole characters of your book change your uh, approach or project at all? Or how does that? affect your development of a book? Well, I mean, only in the sense that then you really are sort of writing by committee and you're managing a bunch of different expectations about, you know, um, if you're dealing with what are generally called flagship characters or franchise characters, you know, Spider-Man at, at Marvel or Batman at DC would be the most obvious examples, then there's a lot more expectations and, and you have more of the weight of the company on your shoulders in a way that, you know, if you're off in your own little, weird little corner, which is where I've spent much of my career, and I do enjoy it quite a bit, but, you know, inevitably that just ends up, then that's when people start to me, right? Because <laughs> that's where I was first known. So it's, oh, give him that thing, you know, uh, which is fine for the most part. Um, then then, you, then it becomes a little bit more of a political minefield. And it, you know, but that's just... Yeah. 
it's more of a it 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 that stuff hopefully gets worked out in the development stage of the project, and you're not if it's that really becomes a serious issue in the scripting process, then something didn't happen. I'm curious of all the things you described of you know uh, the individual issues, ongoing mini series co writing. All do you have a preference? Do you feel like there's a, your work has been strongest with any of these? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, because they do all end up having a beginning, middle, and end. And I guess I've been working for so long uh, in sort of the, the mainstream comics arena, it is hard to sort of see the distinction between us. Because you always do sort of expect... And you know what it is? Is also is the people who read comics, for the most part... Um, I mean, the most common question you get whenever a series ends is, when is it coming back? I'm sure you guys get that at mm-hmm. all the time. Uh, what, even if it's something you've created and something that people really had a definitive end, I still get, you know, well, when is so and so coming back? And I'm like, well, they're dead. And like, <laughs> fans are like, nah, come on, you know, you're holding out on me. Um, so, uh, yeah, at this point, it does kind of all work together, to be honest with you. It's all stories. You know? I think about, I'm almost certain if you asked me this question six years ago, I would have said, Miniseries, hands down, okay. because they all have a definitive boom ending. There's mm-hmm. bodies all over the stage, and, you know, and then the credits roll. You know, that's mm-hmm. it. But uh, it, th- those distinctions have really become uh, fuzzier and fuzzier as all media, you know, TV being a prime example, has moved more to a serialization model, mm-hmm. and that's where a lot of the profit is. Is you have a lot of hesitancy from people to have a definitive boom, it's over. You mm-hmm. know. They, people want to see that there's that there's room for more stories because that's frankly where the money is. Mm-hmm. So you talked a little bit about some of the some of the structure you've used, three act structure, for instance, in order to provide a, a framework for the way stories are told. There's a lot of um, a good story is kind of like a melange of a lot of different things. There's obviously the plot, the reason why the characters are doing what they're doing. There's also a lot of uh, the characters themselves, the way that they're portrayed, their their unique, distinctive traits, and also dialogue, which I think I've always thought that you had some of the best dialogue anywhere in comics. Mm-hmm. So how do you find a balance with that? Some people, I think, I, when you read comics, some writers put more emphasis on big, exploding, planet-wide plot points, sure. less emphasis on character. How do you find the proper balance when approaching a, a new property? Um, you let the story generally dictate that. I mean. Um... It, the catch twenty two of fiction writing is is that um, if you had no plot, it would be boring. But without the people come back to the characters, like mm-hmm. they they want to spend time with those characters. So you need to find a balance of uh, character bits and action bits. And and there's no reason why action bits can't be character bits, but you still want to see people characters interacting with each other. Um, so I would think that um, I mean I think one of the things. That, I think about this a lot because it, it ended up being super successful. Is I did a book for you guys called Archer and Armstrong, mm-hmm. and on the first issue of that is this character Archer, who's this kind of naive kid from the sticks. He's in New York City mm-hmm. for the first time, and there's a whole page of him just wandering around Times Square, talking about his feelings and talking about what he's seeing and writing back. Suppose he's writing back to his sister back at home, and it was it's a it's a it's a pure character bit, and that it's it's just one character talking and interacting with his environment. But I think it ended up being the strongest bit in that series. It was a really great thing to sort of have a foundation uh, to build on because you sort of get Archer immediately and you get that he's not simply this kind of reactive, conservative um, kind of a, a nut. You get that he's a three-dimensional person. Um, and I think that where I've stumbled in the past is where I, didn't, where I forgot or I felt like I didn't have room to... I, I had to cut those quiet bits out. Right. So it's it's the quiet bits are almost the the, the grease that lets the other wheel. Um, so one interesting aspect of being a comic book writer is unlike being a screenwriter who might be constrained by the limitations of special effects or the limitations of a budget that's been set forth, right? What you can actually show on screen, you're really only limited by the capabilities of what the artist you're working with could potentially draw. Sure. Um, that in mind, someone who's come up with like, you're someone who's come up with a lot of big crazy concepts in your time working on comics. What do you think are some? What is the most fun that you've ever had putting something on the page? What's the craziest thing that you can remember putting out there? Oh, well, there's a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, like uh, in Ivar Time Walker, the person who mm-hmm. to mind is that 
Clayton Henry, who's who I did Archer Armstrong with also, is just such a terrific designer. We have this, 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 the, the bad guys have this space station called Obliva One, and he just sort of came up with this completely insane design for that, and that was just sort of amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, we've destroyed the whole universe multiple times in various <laughs> comic books, yeah. you know, and it's, you know, it's always pretty convincing, you know, and so that's always sort of super exciting. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome because it takes the same amount of lines for an artist to draw, you know, a universe exploding, uh, or somebody walking across the street, depending on who that person is and what the street looks like, it's a lot easier to destroy the universe on the page, sure. you know, so that's, that's always the fun part. And that, I think that is, um, one thing that, that, that no matter how good CGI gets, I think that is something, that, something that comics will always have an advantage of over other media. In terms of resources... Now, perhaps more than ever, there's actual books you can go out and buy about how to write comics, but I'm sure when you were starting out, those were few and far between. Are there any kind of writer's resources that you would recommend to someone who's looking to become an aspiring creative writer, regardless of, you know, genre or right. medium? Well, I guess I would have to plug my own book, Make Comics Like the Pros, uh, by me and Greg Pack, the aforementioned mm -hmm. Greg Pack, available now from Random House, uh, and which has a lot of Valiant stuff in there, a lot yep. of Archer Armstrong stuff, for that matter. Uh, that's great. Um, I mean, you know, I, what I memorized was How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way by John DeSiva oh, yeah. and Lisa Classic. Stanley, uh, even though that's very specific to superhero comics and, and through the whole Marvel method of doing things. I think that was super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if you Google Wally Wood's 22 panels that never fail, uh, which is actually, I just found this out recently, it was actually put together not by Wally himself, but by his uh, assistant at the time, Larry Hammack, creator of G.I. Joe, Probably one of the best Wolverine writers of all time. Uh, that's a great sort of visual guide to the, the basic shots you need to tell a comic story. And we do that, we copy that a bit in Make Comics with the Pros, and there's also a version of it in, in How to Draw Comics with the Marvel Way. Uh, and, you know, I, uh, Scott McLeod's book, Understanding Comics, I think is a great, is still a great resource of the theory and philosophy behind comics and how a comic page works and how static drawings give the illusion of movement and emotion. And all that fun stuff. You know, you've talked a lot about your growth. You've answered a lot of questions that you haven't answered now at this point in your career that yeah. you might not have had six years ago. Maybe in six more years, you might have a different point of view. I'm kind of interested. We have so many, you know, uh, writers in our audience. What would you give advice? What advice would you give to a young writer? More than just how to break into comics, what would you give to a younger Fred Van Lente as he yeah. continues his career? No, that's a great question, and I, I think that the uh, this is a very sincere response. You need to give yourself the freedom to fail. Um, you need to not be so precious with every little thing you do. And um, I still, I sabotaged myself a lot when I was starting out by never finishing anything or not thinking that what I was doing was good enough. Um, you really need to, to, to give yourself the ability to finish things, even though, or because of the fact they're not perfect. You know, Hemingway used to say that... Uh, well, he, okay, he didn't use these words exactly, but I've been told I can't use one of these words. Uh, he said, uh, "All of uh, every every first draft is bad, except he didn't say bad." <laughs> um, another thing you like to say is when we talk about writing, what we really mean is rewriting. So give yourself the freedom to be bad and to stink, because until you actually finish something, until you write the end, it's going to be hard for you to go back and then revise it and make it good. So. You know, whether that whether your challenge is your own confidence or time management or all those things, give yourself the freedom to stink, uh, at least initially. And um, because that's how you'll get the knowledge you'll then use to turn around and make yourself good. You make yourself good. You don't no one is born good. You have to make you know, you have to make yourself do that. And so starting out and doing stuff badly at first is the first step to becoming good. Great advice. Uh, final question before we wrap for the day. Uh, if someone wanted to check out one of your Valiant books, where do you think would be a good place to start? I'm going to have to say Hastings. Hastings, there you go. <laughs> any any Fred Van Lente book at Hastings. Exactly. Um, Archer and Armstrong, Ivar Time Walker, a lot of uh, volumes of each of those on shelf, so please be sure to check them out. Yep. Thank you, Fred. No Appreciate that, man. Cool. Great job. And uh, for more information on the rest of our comics co upcoming co Comics College episodes, please visit gohastings.com slash comicscollege. There you can find out where to visit uh, Valiant online, 
as well as the guidelines for submitting your uh, cover art for your chance to become Do the it. cover artist of the Free Comic Book Day 2016 Hastings Exclusive Edition, uh, which is going to be a pretty big deal. Uh, so we look forward to seeing your submissions for those. And until next week, this is Valley Entertainment. See you guys later. Later. You've just experienced class number one of Comics College, your guide to making comics like the pros. Don't forget to enter to win the grand prize, your art on Valiant's 2016 free comic book day comic book. Ask a store associate for details.